All right, let's get started. Today we have Juan Fernando Hernandez Garcia. He's a PhD student here at RLAI, and he's going to tell us about the Cascade Correlation Learning Architecture. Cool. Uh, thank you, Abhishek, and thank you all of you for coming to my talk. Uh, so as Abhishek said, I'm going to be talking about the Cascade Correlation Architecture, which was a constructive neural network architecture that was proposed in the 1990s. But um, despite showing promising results at the beginning, uh, it seems to be in the process of being forgotten. So my purpose with this talk is to introduce you to the Cascade Correlation and I'll also get a little bit of feedback about whether you think this is a promising uh, line of research. But in the process, I'm also going to be talking about, uh, I'm going to build an argument for why it shouldn't be forgotten and why is it relevant for us as a group uh, and also us as a community. Uh, so my talk is going to be go like this. First, I'm going to give you a brief introduction about the Cascade Correlation. Uh, then I'm going to talk about whether it works at all. Uh, and then I'm going to talk about some disadvantages that people have found uh, in the past, but also some extensions that people have proposed in order to address those disadvantages. And finally, I'm going to talk about uh, why it's important that this architecture is not forgotten. So to, so to start us off, uh, here's uh, how it works. Uh, it's a constructive neural network, so it starts from the bottom up. Uh, it starts with just a set of inputs that are directly connected uh, into the output units. Uh, these output units uh, are uh, predictions about some target of interest. For example, uh, the probability that it's going to rain today. Uh, and these green uh, squares uh, represent the weights of the output layer. Now, the, the way that we learn this weight is by minimizing a loss function using your favorite flavor of gradient descent. So we continue minimizing this loss function until it converges, at which point uh, we, we, we can decide to add a new uh, hidden unit to the network. So we first freeze these weights, uh, these output weights, and then uh, we connect a new hidden unit uh, to the network. This hidden unit is connected to the input uh, nodes, and it's noticeable that yet it's not connected to the output layer yet. Um, so in order to train this uh, hidden unit, uh, we're going to maximize uh, the correlation between the activation of this hidden unit and the prediction error of and the residual error of the network. Uh, in plain words, uh, what we want this hidden unit to do is to be the most active for those data points that have the highest error. So we continue uh, maximizing this correlation uh, with gradient descent, uh, and eventually when learning uh, plateaus, we freeze these weights, uh, and then we connect this hidden unit to the output layer. Um, at that point, we unfreeze all the output weights, and we retrain the output layer, uh, and then we continue training until, it, uh, until learning plateaus again. At that point, we add a new hidden unit to the network. Uh, and notice how this hidden unit is now connected to the previous hidden unit. Uh, we train the hidden unit, we freeze the weight, and we connect it to the output layer. We unfreeze the output uh, layer weights, and then we train those weights again. And this process just continues on and on until eventually, according to some stopping criteria, we just stop, uh, stop adding uh, hidden units to the network. Uh, and even though like in this that diagram and showing only one unit at a time, it's also possible to train a pool of candidate units uh, and then select from that pool whichever is the best. Uh, now, here's a practical example of how it uh, actually works. Uh, for this example, I'm going to be using a task that I call the egg domain. In this task, uh, we have data points that have two values, an x and y value, uh, that are between 0 and 1. Uh, and the label is going to be determined by the position in, the, in this domain. If they are inside of this yellow uh, egg, they're going to be labeled 1. If, that, if they're outside of the egg, they're going to be labeled 0. Uh, so in order to start training the network, we train uh, just uh, the output layer. Uh, and after it converges, we will see some prediction that looks some, somewhat like this. Uh, so these are still the same data points, but now uh, the color represents the prediction. The more yellow it is, the closer it is to 1. The darker it is, uh, the closer it is to 0. And we can see that this is actually not a great prediction because it's nowhere close to the egg shape that we want. So we decide to add a hidden uh, unit. Uh, now, in order to train this hidden unit, we maximize the correlation that it has with, uh, with the residual error. And we uh, obtain an activation pattern that looks like this. So what we see here is that this hidden unit is the most active on the left side of the domain. After we obtain this hidden unit, we add it to the network and we train the output layer again to obtain a different prediction, which looks like this. Uh, and now this process continues on and on. We add another hidden unit, which has an activation pattern that looks like this. 
And we then add it to the network, uh, train the output layer, and we obtain a prediction that looks like this. And the process just goes on and on and on until we decide to stop. At some point, after adding enough hidden units, uh, we'll get to a prediction that looks pretty close to what we want. So that's the final prediction after adding several uh, uh, hidden units. So now, what are the advantages of these architectures? Uh, well, uh, as uh, Folman and LeBier, uh, the original authors of this architecture pointed out, uh, uh, the architecture uh, doesn't need to specify a network topology. So there's less filling to be done uh, with hyperparameters. Uh, they also claim that it was able to fit uh, the data in a smaller number of epochs than backpropagation. Uh, they also uh, reported that uh, it trains very fast because only one set of weight is being trained uh, at any given epoch. And finally, they also uh, found that it resulted in reasonably small networks, although they were not necessarily optimal. So after reading this paper, uh, it struck me that uh, given all these advantages, uh, the casket correlation is not that popular anymore nowadays. So to me, that pointed out uh, that at some point between 1990 and 2020, uh, somebody found out that this architecture wasn't that great at all. Uh, and so I set up the goal to figure out whether it was if, whether there was something fundamentally wrong with the cascade correlation uh, by just uh, some uh, performing some empirical evaluations. Uh, so what I did is uh, I implemented three toy domains uh, to test whether the cascade uh, the cascade correlation's ability to fit the data, its ability to generalize to unseen uh, data. Uh, how robust it is to noise. And finally, I also uh, tried on the MNIST data set to see if it could scale up to bigger problems. Now, I know that MNIST by today's standards is not that big, but uh, by 1990 standards, it was actually un unimaginable to solve. Uh, so what two problems I'm gonna be using? Uh, well, I'm gonna reuse the egg domain as before. I'm also gonna use two other problems that are very similar. I'm gonna call them the XOR domain and the ring domain. Uh, for all these domains, uh, inputs are only two, uh, only have two values, an X and Y value, and uh, the label depends on where they are in the domain. If they are in the yellow region, they uh, have a label of one. If they are in the uh, darker region, they have a label of zero. Uh, so let's answer the first question: Can it fit the data? Uh, so let's see what happened in the extra domain. Uh, I also included a backpropagation uh, uh, baseline just to add a reference point and see how well it, uh, the cascade correlation is performing. This baseline uh, was uh, has two hidden layers uh, and it's trained with an optimizer. And all the algorithms were trained on uh, in this in this in this problem they were trained with about five thousand uh, training examples. Sorry, so Tahir is asking. Uh, do we only train the last layer once we have added a new unit? Yes, we only train the last layer once we have added a new unit. Um, okay, so where was I? Yeah, so uh, so here is the training accuracy of the cascade correlation and the backpropagation network uh, on this XOR domain. Uh, and we can see that uh, both networks are perfectly fine at fitting the data, uh, although the cascade correlation does have uh, show a few more outliers. Um, and we see a similar result. Uh, in the uh, egg and ring domain, uh, both networks are perfectly fine at fitting the data, but the cascade correlation does show a few more outliers than the backpropagation network. And I'm going to say a little bit more about those outliers later on. Can you uh, tell so us what these dots are? Sorry? Can you tell us what these dots are? Uh, so those are the data points plotted in the in in just uh, plotted in the first uh, quadrant of the x and y axis. These are multiple oh. iterations of the. Oh, which dots? Sorry, do you mean the dots in the box plots? Yeah, in the plots. Yes. Sorry, uh, those are the outliers. So the uh, how outliers are determined in uh, in uh, in a box plot is just by taking the difference between the first and third quartile uh, and multiplying that by one point five. Using multiple runs. Uh, those are the whiskers. Yes, and uh, we did uh, 100 runs. I did 100 runs for this. Uh, hyperparameters, uh, I tried to tune, uh, I did research to find the best hyperparameters for those, uh, for both the backpropagation and the cas cascade correlation. So they're reasonably uh, well tuned. Uh, yeah, so this is like the, 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 the lowest bar that we would expect a network to clear. So, so far, there's nothing surprising. Uh, so the next question is how well does it generalize to uh, unseen data? Uh, 
Now for this uh, experiment, uh, I'm also gonna be using the three toy domains, uh, but I'm gonna be changing the size of the training data uh, of the training set. Uh, I change it from 200 all the way to 2,500. Uh, for the plots, I'm gonna be showing two box plots for each uh, algorithm. The one that is, looks faded, uh, that's the training accuracy. And the one that it's brighter is the test accuracy. Uh, what we, the thing that is of interest here is how big is the gap between the train accuracy and the test accuracy. So these are the results for uh, these two algorithms uh, when trained on 200 uh, training examples. Uh, and again, just as a reminder, these two are train accuracies and these two are test accuracies. So what we see here is that uh, both algorithms have some gap between the train accuracy and the test accuracy. Uh, however, uh, for the casting correlation, that gap is a little bit bigger. Uh, this is not that discouraging, though, because as we increase the, the size of the training set, this gap gets smaller and, and smaller. Uh, so that means that at least it's a good sign that as we uh, give it more, uh, more data, it learns, uh, it generalizes better. Um, for the circle domain, we find similar results. Uh, with 200 examples, there's some gap, but this gap gets smaller and smaller as we add more data to the train set. Uh, and still, the backpropagation network seems to be generalizing, generalizing a little bit better. And in the ring domain, we also find similar results, but they are a little bit more extreme because this, both networks seem to be, be having a harder time to learn the task. Uh, the backpropagation network, uh, I tune uh, the size of the hidden layers so all the way from two neurons per layer to, uh, to 32 neurons per layer. Uh, the classic correlation end up being uh, bigger in these uh, cases. Uh, yeah, so we can see that the gap gets closer and closer, uh, smaller and smaller. Uh, so is this uh, discouraging? I think it's not that discouraging because although the classic correlation doesn't generalize as well in these two domains, uh, it does offer some advantages. So we still don't have to uh, define the network topology at, at the beginning of training, and it still trains a lot, a little bit faster. Uh, during training, because it only it's only uh, learning a set of weights on every epoch. Um, now, uh, how robust is it to noise? Uh, for this experiment, I still uh, use the same three domains. Yeah. Uh, so the way that, the way that I selected hyperparameters is by uh, choosing the one with the highest uh, test accuracy uh, in ten runs. So I would have selected the one that overfit the least to the training data. Uh, but you are right, like it's definitely overfitting more to the training data, uh, training set uh, than the backpropagation network. Uh, OK, so back to this, uh, uh, this task. Uh, these are the same three domains, but now the labels are corrupted. 10% 10 10 of the labels are, are wrong. Uh, and now for the uh, plots, I'm going to be still showing you two box plots for each algorithm. The one that is faded is the test accuracy on the original data set without any noise. Uh, and the one that is brighter, it's uh, the test accuracy on the noisy uh, data set. Now, what's uh, important to point here is that the network strain on the noisy data uh, can only get uh, a maximum accuracy of 90% because 10% of the labels are wrong. Uh, so we can see in this block plot uh, that both uh, the, the backpropagation network and the cascade correlation are close to the maximum accuracy that they can get. Um, uh, so I'm going to continue on. Uh, uh, so for uh, for the egg domain, we, we see a similar thing. Uh, this the test accuracy is very close to 90%, which is encouraging. And for the ring uh, domain, we see a slightly different result. Uh, the backpropagation is doing well, but the cascade correlation network it's just struggling a little bit. But we saw from previous results that it was already struggling in the ring domain. Um, finally, I decided to test this on the MNIST data set just to see if it can scale up to a bigger problem. Uh, so if, as a reference, uh, yeah, so what activities are used for the cascade correlation? Uh, both networks, the backpropagation network and the cascade correlation are using sigmoid uh, activations. Um, yeah, so, as, uh, so I tried this on MNIST. Uh, the, uh, digit classification data set. Uh, in this case, these are the results. The box plot on the left corresponds to the accuracy on the train set, and the box plot, plot on the right is the accuracy on the test set. Uh, as a baseline, I'm just referring to uh, 
uh, neural network, network train in Jan LeCun's paper uh, in 1998 that has one hidden layer and three hidden, uh, 300 hidden units. Uh, so what we see here is that uh, it's, uh, the classic correlation is fairly close to the, the, the neural network train with backpropagation. Uh, so, so far I don't, uh, I don't think there's, very, uh, there's an obvious choice of which uh, particular architecture is better because both of them have their advantages and their disadvantages. Uh, so I decided to refer to the literature to see if somebody else had found any other problems with the casket correlation that could explain why it's not that popular anymore. Uh, so, and yeah, it's the, it, in fact, many people have found many disadvantages, but at the same time, uh, many people have proposed for several extensions to address those disadvantages. The main disadvantage, or the very first disadvantage that people found was that this can result in a very deep network with a very large fanning. So fanning just refers to the pattern that this diagram shows as we keep adding more hidden units, how it starts looking like a fan. Uh, and this is in fact a problem. Like I, uh, my, my, the casket correlations that I showed before are actually pretty big. They have about 100, 200 hidden units. Uh, so, but, it, but also in order to address that problem, people have to just several solutions, such as instead of focusing on adding to in uh, making the network deeper, instead, uh, we could make it wider. And there has uh, been done extensive work on this, uh, on this disadvantage. Uh, another thing that people have found uh, is the tendency of the network to overfit to training data. Uh, as we actually saw in the previous uh, results. Um, however, uh, it has also been proposed in the past uh, to uh, modify the training of the casket correlation to maximize the margins between the decision uh, boundary and the data points. And we know from theory that this actually uh, helps generalization. Uh, uh, I'm gonna address that question later. Uh, yeah, so what are these disadvantages have the people found in the past? Uh, well, uh, it, it was pointed out very early on that adding a bad unit can have a terrible effect in performance. Uh, this is, uh, this is how, uh, I hypothesize that this is the reason we see so many outliers with the casket correlation, uh, because at some point in the network adding a, added a really bad hidden unit at the beginning, uh, which uh, totally affected how it learned later on. Um, uh, now, uh, in order to address the problem, uh, we can increase the size and variety of the candidates. Uh, yeah, what makes the candidate, uh, the unit bad? Um, that's a good question. Uh, the only way that I can define bad is like after adding it, learning didn't improve that much more after that. So there's uh, several runs in which you add a hidden unit, and although in many different runs with the same hyperparameters, you would keep improving performance, after adding this hidden unit, it just the performance doesn't uh, improve that much more anymore. Uh, I do need to look further into what means for it to be bad, but it, right now it just means that adding a hidden unit doesn't uh, affects the performance of the network uh, after that. Uh, so to address this issue, we can increase the number of candidate units that we train, uh, but we still have some probability of adding a, a hidden unit that will affect performance. Uh, but we could also prune uh, the relevant units from the network. So if a network doesn't seem to be very relevant, we can remove it. Um, uh, some people also pointed out that this, uh, the casket correlation is not suitable for regression, but there has also been some uh, many modifications and several alternatives objectives uh, for training the hidden units to address this problem. Uh, and finally, many were com uh, concerned about whether this still results in a universal approximator which is one of the uh, main appeals of using deep neural networks. Uh, and theoreticians have actually shown that uh, the casket correlation can actually uh, approximate a, a reasonable uh, number of uh, functions, uh, but also uh, the alternative objectives that have been proposed do result in a universal uh, approximator, uh, which is good. Um, now, so, so far, I, don't, I still can't answer the question, should we, uh, why, like, why is it being forgotten? Uh, there doesn't seem to be an obvious reason why we should stop paying attention to the casket correlation, but I would argue that there are good reasons why we should care about it, us as a community. Uh, I'm going to address all the questions at the end. Uh, so why should we care as a community? Uh, well, uh, it's nice that just uh, by design, the casket correlation addresses two big issues uh, uh, that deep, deep neural networks face uh, in continual learning. And that is the problem of uh, capacity saturation and the problem of catastrophic forgetting. So capacity saturation is when a network 
doesn't have enough capacity to keep learning a task. Uh, uh, and the way that the cask correlation addresses this problem is by not having a fixed topology and keep being able to uh, grow over time. Now, does this mean that the capacity saturation problem is solved? No, because at some point, the hardware that is implemented, the cascade correlation will run out of memory. So if the cascade correlation is not adding, uh, uh, it just keeps adding bad hidden units, uh, then the problem itself is not going to be addressed at all. Uh, uh, for catastrophic forgetting, uh, this problem is addressed because most of the network is actually frozen during learning. So there's less risk of overriding information as we keep learning. Uh, it has actually been shown in, in the past that uh, uh, the cascade correlation can do cur curriculum learning without, uh, with only one rehearsal phase at the end to train the last output layer. Um, now, uh, what do you care about the cascade correlation? Uh, well, I, my main interest of this is because it's an instance of the generate and test. Uh, uh, and there seems to be a lot of growing interest in the generate and test. And moreover, this, uh, uh, this is a generated and test instance that actually has convergence guarantees, which is good. Uh, how good is this convergence is still up in the air. Uh, there, there are some cases when we can actually tell how good this convergence is, uh, but it's good to have some theoretical results about it. Uh, now, I know to, to see how this uh, generate and test algorithm. Uh, Connor? Okay, so to see how this is a generate and test algorithm, uh, uh, you can think about the process that initializes the hidden units as the generator and the process that selects which hidden units to add to the network as the as a tester. And if on top of it, we add a pruning method, we can continually keep testing units to see if they're still relevant and remove them if they are not. Um, uh, so finally, so what's next after this? This seems all very preliminary. And, I'm just mostly looking for feedback and see what people thoughts about about the cascade correlations are uh, are. Um, but what I want to do next with this project is uh, I want my final goal is to see if uh, we can use it for online reinforcement learning, specifically whether this would be helpful for uh, eliminating the need for experience replay and target networks in deep uh, reinforcement learning. As uh, intermediate goals, I want to see how well does it. Uh, learn value functions from batch data, and then move on to online uh, reinforcement learning with replay buffers. Uh, I'm also interested in studying uh, different generation and pruning strategies that could be used. Uh, and finally, I would also like to try with some uh, adaptive learning rate methods, uh, so as to eliminate more hy hyperparameters from the whole uh, architecture. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, so there are several questions that I didn't answer. Uh, how does the cascade correlation compare to the fully connected network with the number of training updates? Uh, wall club time. Uh, so learning updates, uh, the cascade correlation ends up doing uh, a lot more. Uh, I don't have any uh, tables to show, but uh, it ends up doing a lot more, but it turns out, but because again, it's only training one set of weights uh, on every epoch, uh, it, it's actually faster in terms of wall clock time. Uh, now, this is a little bit hand wavy because I don't have uh, evidence of this. Uh, just from my own experience, that's what I found, and I should actually provide some evidence of, of that later on if I am to continue working on this project. Uh, what else? I think that was the only. Oh. So have I plotted the decision boundary of uh, for the CC? Have you noticed any interesting properties? Uh, no, I haven't plotted it. Uh, like the, the initial example that I show is somewhat an approximation of it with 5,000 uh, units, but uh, I mean, with 5,000 data points, uh, but no, I haven't plotted the actual decision boundary. Uh, for the MNIST experiment, is the size of the final cascade correlation network and BP network comparable? So for the MNIST experiment, actually, the cascade correlation used less hidden units. Uh, uh, it only used 200 hidden units. Uh, although I didn't uh, tune those hyperparameters very thoroughly because I was running out of time for this talk. Uh, so I kind of uh, just tested a few of them. Uh, it's possible that we could get better performance with that add more hidden units. Martha? 
I'm kind of curious about understanding what the features are that the network learns. Uh, we sort of have like these views of what we think neural networks learn. You know, let's say you have like a deeper network. We sort of imagine there's some abstraction going on and that like this depth is making this abstraction. And now here there isn't the same feed forward structure. There's like a linearity, you add these features on and there's some depth, but there's also like connections from the very initial features all the way to later features. Is there some interpretation I should have for like different features in this architecture? Uh, so there's some intuition why we max would maximize the correlation. Uh, we can think about the covariance as defining an inner product between the two random vectors. Uh, and then the correlation is basically the normalized inner products of this. Uh, uh, yeah, this is the inner product, but normalized, uh, which is also could be um, considered as the cosine similarity between these two, uh, uh, these two random vectors. So as we maximize the cosine similarity, the angle between the two random vectors uh, gets smaller and smaller. So they are pointing in almost in the same direction. And uh, what this process does is makes it so that the new hidden unit captures as much of the variance of the residual error as it can. So this, this turns into uh, that hidden unit being the most active uh, for those data points that have the highest error. Right, it's very boosting-like, like you have some sort of feature. Yeah, yeah, it's actually. Equal error and then, but, but I guess I'm just trying to figure out then what, how should I interpret these features? Like, is it, what kind of functions do these learn? You know, I could imagine that I learn linear functions where I go get the next feature that reduces my residual in like a linear correlation kind of way, but this is nonlinear. Yeah, uh, so I, I'm gonna refer back to the example with the egg domain. Yeah. I'm just gonna, it's gonna take a bit to get. the diagram for cascading. I get that it can learn nonlinear things. Obviously, you showed me it does. I'm just trying to get an intuition for what the parts of the network or how I should interpret those features. Like deeper in, higher in the fan, I guess I should think of those features as more abstract or yes. not more. So, for example, something. So, for here is like uh, the first, the, the plot on the top is the first prediction, and the plot on the bottom is the first activation of the first hidden unit. Uh, but then as we keep adding, uh, so then we, we predict, we train the output layer again, uh, and we add another hidden unit, and then the activation of the next hidden unit looks like this. And they start looking more and more abstract as we keep adding more activations. So the next hidden unit after that looks like that. Uh, and then it just, you just start getting weirder, weirder and weirder patterns. But as an interpretation, I don't, I don't, I, I don't think I, yeah. I mean, it's not I, I, anyway, so I'm not, like, it's not like I actually understand what neural networks are doing either, but. Thanks, Fernando. Whilst others ask questions, can you go back to the, said, uh, Can you just show the diagram of cascade correlation as uh -huh. someone else asks a question, just so I can stare at it, if you don't mind? I'm just, this is okay, very slow. Okay, I'll mute myself now. There, there, there you go. Uh, are these equivalent to gradient boosted trees? I have here an anecdotal evidence of good performance of those on various tasks. Uh, yeah, I think people have uh, actually drawn analogies between the casket correlation and the gradient boosted uh, decision trees, uh, but I haven't looked too much into that connection. Uh, so there, there I, I do believe there's a connection there. Uh, I don't know if they're exactly equivalent though. Um, yeah, uh, Robin asked, uh, seems a little bit res like residual networks. Do you have any thoughts on comparing them? Uh, this is still very preliminary, so that's why I didn't look into comparing with more complicated networks. Uh, this is also like the very, like, the, like basically the, uh, the algorithm uh, almost as if it was proposed in 1990. Uh, but you're right, like the skip connections are very uh, reminiscent of residual uh, networks. Um, it would be interesting to see a comparison between the two, the, between the two of them. Mm. Is the cascade correlation for online real-time learning? I guess it's lower as, uh, sorry, is the cascade correlation appropriate for online real-time learning? It gets lower as you add more features. So that's true, like as we keep adding more and more features, uh, uh, we get this huge fan in that like, Increases the width of the sorry the, the depth of the of the network significantly, but that's why I pointed out to previous work that have looked into making the 
network deeper, I mean, sorry, wider instead of deeper, uh, which would address some of this problem. It would still, uh, at that point, it would just face the same disadvantage as a, new, as a really big neural network. Uh, it would basically be a big neural network that you have to, um, uh, you, you have to compute every time you need to make a prediction. Uh, some interesting work has been done on, uh, uh, instead of adding hidden units uh, uh, to the network, uh, we could add just like predictions of all other neural networks, uh, which can make the network more modular. And maybe it, we, we could take advantage of that to, uh, uh, to address this problem. Sorry, I don't know exactly how, but uh, I was just thinking out loud. Uh, Adam uh, says, uh, CC avoids backprop. All learning is linear. That makes it pretty different to ResNets to me. Yeah, so that's a good comment. Uh, you said that you find it interesting. Any more questions? Sorry, can I go ahead? You said that yeah. you find this interesting because of test and generate and test. How is it similar to that? So we or how is it can also see uh, it has a process that generates features. It has a process that uh, tests those features. How is it different? Sorry, Jivan, can you repeat yeah, your this question? This my question. What is the similarity with generate and test? Because in generate and test, we find out new features. Here we are building, building on top of the old ones. Um, you're right. It's not exactly the same, uh, but you can also have a process that is generating these features and then a process that is testing these features and adding it to the network. Uh, you're right in like, uh, it's not exactly the same generate and test that we have seen in other presentations uh, this summer. Uh, but I think uh, if you think of a bigger framework of generate and test where you, there's a generator and there's a tester, this, this particular architecture actually fits that framework fairly well. Yeah, as Matt points out, to generate and test doesn't prevent you from building on top of other features. Well, the other thing is that this generator, in some sense, is actually looking at the data, right? It's not just making up new features randomly. It's actually making up features and minimize residue and error. So if you're doing that, then anything can be called generate and test, right? <laughs> well, OK, maybe I cheated a little bit with that. Uh, no, OK. Um, so I'm going to ask a question, which is like to me the it's the the success of the method really depends on how successful your pruning strategies are, because otherwise it's just going to grow larger and larger. And especially if the word is not stationary, then you have to forget what you learned in the past. So how successful are those pruning strategies that people have tried to come up? I haven't looked a lot into pruning. I mostly uh, looked a lot into generating hidden units. Uh, that, that's why I, my next uh, like intermediate goal is to like actually look deeper into the pruning strategies that have been proposed in the past. Uh, so I don't know how successful they are yet. Yeah, I think that's an important point because like you mentioned that you uh, like this architecture because of its promise for continual learning. And so, it, so continual learning has like two parts, right? A, you don't want to forget important things, but you also want to forget things that are no longer relevant. And yeah. then so it seems to do the former by freezing the weights. But uh, yeah, I guess we still need to figure out how it would forget things. And it has definitely been proposed and studied. Uh, I just haven't had the time to look at it. Uh, and so next step, looking at it and seeing and implementing that. Uh, like we also have to prune online, right? That's also an important constraint because at least in the back propagation literature, those algorithms are different, but people have tried to prune them for continuous learning. And whatever importance metrics they come up with, they don't work well online. Uh, so here again, I guess that's where the challenge is. Maybe that's why they're not popular, that it's not easy to prune them online in a scalable way, but maybe it is possible. Uh, 
I also think that I have a slide at the end that I didn't add because I was running out of time. But one of the reasons why I believe it's not, unpop it's not as popular, uh, it's just straight up uh, a chance. Uh, so what I did is I plotted the number of citations uh, that the casket correlation received over time. And there's something interesting that happened right after it was introduced. Let me just get to that slide. Uh, sorry. OK, so so here are the numbers in 90. And we see that it's definitely been, uh, becoming less, less popular over time. Uh, if we compare it to the back propagation, uh, you can see it's, the story is completely different uh, between the two of them. Uh, but what's interesting is uh, uh, Scott Fallman actually stopped receiving funding in 1992 uh, to keep working on the casket correlation. So he had to completely switch. Uh, uh, his uh, research to something else because the U.S. was just not funding uh, the CASC, the, this type of research anymore. And in 1993, there was like a particular type of funding that the Department of Defense in the U.S. Uh, terminated, and then uh, that's that marked basically the beginning of a new AI winter. Uh, so all the research that had that was being done in AI in the states was just completely ter terminated at that point. On the other hand, Geoffrey Hinton and uh, and uh, Joshua Venger were actually uh, working in Canada where they could still work on whatever they wanted with, uh, well, without worrying too much about funding. So that allowed them to keep working on the, on the backpropagation algorithm and keep pumping out papers about it. So that could have been one of the reasons why uh, the casket correlation is not as popular anymore. Now, this is very speculative, but, but I think it's interesting. So you're saying the Canadians weren't afraid of winter and so they won. Basically. <laughs> I think another reason is that people don't care about online learning that much in neural network community for some reason. And once they start, start caring about it, then these methods or similar methods would get more popular. So I have a comment, which is that, um, so this cascade correlation thing, it's not just a network architecture. It's a combination of an architecture and a training scheme, right? Uh, so, um, so uh, like for example, people have shown that there are lots of neural network architectures that are bad at training, but good at representation. So you can, for example, train a deep network, but then train a shallow network to mimic the deep network, and it has good performance, even though the shallow network could not have learned something on its own, right? Mm. Um, and so similarly, with, I guess one of the, the nice things about backpropagation is that it is not mandating a network architecture. It's saying you can take any architecture, and then you can train it using using backpropagation, right? So I would be interested in sort of disentangling how much of the benefits are the problems with cascade correlation, how much of that is coming because of this architecture with this giant fan in versus the training regimen, which is, you know, which is freezing parts of the network uh, and then training them in pieces and so on, right? I think that would be an interesting question to answer. So you would think, for example, uh finding uh, from the cascade correlation at topology and then compare the results of like learning that same architecture, but with backpropagation? Right. So for example, you can take the cascade correlation network that would result after many, many iterations. And in principle, you can take that giant network and then just freeze parts of it that you're not training at in the beginning, right? Uh, and that is equivalent to this sort of iterative expansion, right, in principle. Um, so the mm -hmm. question is, so now my question is, given that network architecture, which is the end result of cascade correlation, um, like you can separate these two. You can say, okay, what happens when I train that with back propagation, right? Mm -hmm. uh, so you're sort of asking different questions. So how much of this is due to the network architecture and how much of it is due to uh, training? Another thing you could try is you could train a classifier using cascade correlation um, and then train uh, using backpropagation, train a different network to match the predictions of the cascade correlation network, right? Um, with synthetic data. So that's just like replicating one network in a different architecture, right? Mm -hmm. That would also sort of answer this question of how much of the advantage is coming because of the training method versus like the architecture of the network, right? Yeah, that's, 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 I think that's a good idea for an experiment. Uh, I'll look into it. Oh, and then I guess my other question, since, uh, yeah, my other question is so like, uh, I don't know how fashionable it is nowadays to like 
uh, shall we have like convolutional networks and things like that, right? Like these sort of structured representations that are for particular data types. Um, and I guess one of the the success of backprop, backprop got tied up with the success of those architectures, right? So I guess my other question would be how easy is it to implement things like CNNs and various other structured networks using this? Because to me, this seems more like trees in the sense that you have very small units, like you have basically linear classifiers with a logistic unit at the end of it, right? And then you're sort of building up trees of these things. Um, and so for example, like one of the your slides was saying that if you have max margin classifiers, uh, then that somehow performs better, which is the same as saying that now I'm going to make a tree out of SVM units, right? Because support vector metrics are also linear classifiers with mm -hmm. max margin, right? So yeah, anyway, that was a rambly thought, but yeah, I'd be interested in that. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, sorry, uh, going back to your point about why, uh, like how would you incorporate, for example, different type of architectures, like such as convolutional convolutions here to the cast cast the correlation. Uh, I, I also think the reason why it's not as popular anymore. Uh, it's certainly easier to just uh, define a convolutional layer and uh, just start training with black prop propagation. Whereas if you wanted to do the same in the cascade correlation, you, know, you don't only have to think about the, uh, the new type of layer, but you also need to think about how you're going to add it to this existing network. And that just adds a little bit more difficulty uh, to the whole, whole problem of doing uh, deep neural networks. Um, yeah. And in general, you can think of the units of the cascade correlation as being other neural networks, right? So here, each step in the cascade was one linear classified with one nonlinearity. But it doesn't have to be. It could be just any other nonlinear function that you have learned in any other way, right? So to me, this seems like a way of combining together other yeah. classifiers to get better results in the end. And here, the classifiers happen to be linear, but they could be other neural networks as well. Yeah, and they, there has been actually proposals on in which, again, uh, instead of hidden units, you ask different classifiers that you already have trained from before, uh, and you just add them if they have like really if they actually improve performance or not. Uh, there's like different criteria on how when to add them, but you're right. Like instead, of, like we could have several different classifiers, and then we can decide one at a time which one to add at which point in training. Um, so it, it also offers some flexibility in that way. Um, one of the Maybe just adding more comments to another nice things of the cascade correlation. Uh, theoretical results actually show that if the uh, if the hidden if the target function lies within the span of the set of all hidden units, so all the hidden units that you are trying to train, uh, train, uh, then the the convergence rate is one over the number of hidden. Yeah, it's in the order of uh, all big O of one over the number of hidden units. Uh, so that's a pretty nice res neat result, but what we, how we could use this for, uh, for example, uh, reinforcement learning, if we are learning a value function and we can decompose those value functions into several other value functions, uh, so other GVFs, that we could, the number of GVFs that we would need by training them in a cascaded way would be one over, uh, uh, but would be in the same order, one over, uh, or big O of one over a number of uh, uh, value functions. Uh, I, I was trying to, uh, I was trying to think uh, how uh, to connect like Chris's idea of uh, truncated returns to this cascade correlation because it also shows a similar pattern where uh, the, the shorter uh, truncated return uh, value function, uh, it's learned faster. And then uh, it's just, you see this cascading effect with where the shorter one learns first and then the second one, then the third one and so on and so forth. And I just want to see if there's a relationship between that and this cascaded, like cascade correlation too. Any more questions? Um, maybe a bit of a clarification. Like you were saying that one problem with these networks was like the large fan in, um, mm -hmm. so, and people were trying to figure out how to avoid that. So what is the problem with having large fan in? Uh, so many of the, many people point out that like, first one of the problems of having like a very deep network is that uh, passing information through the network is uh, can be parallelizable, right? Like if you have this structure, you need to wait for it 
uh, one hidden unit to be processed before you compute in the next hidden unit. So you would rather have a deeper, uh, wider network than a deeper network. So that's one problem, but also as I think Sahir pointed out, uh, as you keep adding more and more units, uh, uh, the, the final layer gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger over time. Uh, again, it just grows linearly uh, with the number of units, uh, but that some people just didn't like that either. <laughs> Do you think certain types of data sets will be particularly far, hard for CC to learn? What properties might that relate to? Hmm. That's a good question, and I don't know how to. Hmm. I would think to be more. I will have to think more about it. Uh, but I'm not sure now, like to make a conclusive statement about it. Sorry, Robin. All right. If there are no more questions, let's all thank Fernando for the cool talk. Thank you, everyone. Finally, I can go to sleep. Sleep, sleep is for the week. <laughs> I mean, say that after like four days of straight up just not getting more than four hours of sleep. Shouldn't you treat yourself to what? The breath of wild? <laughs> No, no, I, I, I'll leave that to Christmas. Sure. Okay, see y'all. <laughs>